Great. Welcome to Digital Asset News, everybody. So instead of talking about the news today, I want to just take a look at what's going on with some on-chain data. Just do a little an, quick analysis about what's going on. I think that there's, just like the title and uh, the thumbnail suggested, there's a little bit of shakiness, which I think we can all feel. We can all see it around us. And I think there's a, a shakeout coming, like there always is. And that's always going to be there. But the big thing is, what are you going to do about it? So what we're going to do is we're just going to break it down real quick. Uh, first of all, I need to take a look at uh, why is there so much leverage going on? And the reason is because 60.24% of people are still in the money. I'm going to take it down that hole, that rabbit hole, just to show you uh, just how much is uh, going on. Also, take a look at another couple of metrics. Uh, who's in the money? Hodl waves and uh, monthly averages. And then last, we're going to talk about the plan, my plan. Not potentially your plan, which is what I'm actually doing. And what I like to always say is uh, failing to plan means you are really planning to fail. So it's really important just to get that plan going. But just like Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And then lastly, uh, we'll just go over a Q&A, five questions in five minutes, because I'm sure you're going to have some questions after this. So first of all, let's take a little bit of market recap. And if you're here for the live stream, welcome. Thanks for stopping by on a Saturday. Uh, if you're watching the replay, just know there's going to be timestamps below so you can skip ahead to whatever you want to do because time is precious. Speaking of which, let's get into the market. So just as we were talking about, it's kind of like a sideways chop with a little bit of uh, depreciation. And that's exactly what's going on. You'd, you don't need me to tell you that because you look at your portfolio all the time. I know you do. That's just how it is. Bitcoin's down. Ethereum's down. Tether. Nobody cares. Uh, Terra. Hey, look at that. Polka dot's up a little bit. Good job. But everything is a little bit red, but not hugely. Like in the traditional market, this is like the sky is falling day. 2% down and 1.3%. But in crypto, we just call this a Saturday. Not a big deal. File coins up. And this is where things are going. And the question that I have is, you know, we have nothing but, we have a ton of good news out there. So what's going on? Well, if we, first of all, before we get in the news and stuff like that, let's just take a look real quick at the Bitcoin chart. And this is what I'm talking about as, as far as like the shakiness. And you actually saw this on the thumbnail because I just pulled this, this chart 20 minutes ago. And you could just see that there was quite a little bit of a, it wasn't a huge drop. It went from 40,519 all the way to 40,000 almost straight. And then it just bounces back up. So this is the shakiness. This is the volatility. This is what we're, we're pretty much used to. And then on top of that, uh, we also have to remember that there's this little thing called fear and greed index. And what, what's amazing to me is that just yesterday or a couple of days ago, 28, 28, we were at 22, 18 hours ago. And then what else? 22, 22, 28, 28, and just 25. And it bounces up just around, I don't know, you know, the metrics, all the data that, that is being pulled. But it seems to me like the more that we chop sideways, the more people are like, yeah, I'm kind of scared, but not that big of a deal. Not enough to not hit some leverage plays. And what I'm talking about here leads me to my next point, which is the leverage parts. Why is there so much leverage right now? It seems like there's a ton of it. Not like it seems, it is. And we can take a look at our friends over at well, let me sign in. That's one thing I hate about this, <laughs> about uh, CryptoQuant, just for me, because I pull the data, then I actually get the, the video going, and then it only allows you for like 10 minutes. So we take a look here at leverage ratio. Let me blow this up so you can see it. You can't see it. And I talked about this before. And again, if you're doing leverage plays and making money, congratulations. I mean, I'm not going to fault you for that. But it's just amazing to me that, the, well, first of all, the leverage ratio, just so you know, estimated leverage ratio is defined as a ratio of open interest divided by the reserves of an exchange. So when we take a look here about what's going on, anything above 0.2 is pretty high. And you can see that throughout the course of time, since this has been tracking it, it hasn't been that much, 0 0.069, 0 0.1, which is back in 2019. But just kind of get, people get, I'll just say it, people get ballsy. That's what it is. Uh, you got a leverage ratio of 0 0.18, so pretty close. And then it kind of dips down and 0 0.18 again. Chop sideways. And look at this. The price goes up massively, you know? And people are like, I can get into that. Maybe I'll short it. And I got to tell you, and we've talked about this before, people who short Bitcoin actually do pretty darn good. I don't short because I'm not a big trader. But I just take a look at the charts and go, what is going on here? Because again, it goes up like this. I guarantee people shorted it here because of the risk ratio. And then if we go down, and then here we are, 
Let me pull this up again so you can see it. See here, this looks pretty low, but it's not. It's 0 0.19. And then we just had a massive run up, 0 0.24. As the price went higher, I'm sure people shorted. Comes down here. And then look at this. Even with all this volatility, the ratio is 0 0.24. We might hit 0 0.3, which would be extremely high leverage ratio on a continuum of 0 to 1. So the question then is, what's going on? You know, why is this, why is this so high? And if I take a look, well, first of all, just, for, just to jump back here, to, to take a look at like all the different shorts versus longs, coinglass.com, long short ratio, links in the description, you can find it. You can see a lot of people like the short. But this, is, this is on the five minute chart, of course, but look at this. Here's the greens, the longs. Here's the shorts. Just looking at the mentality of people right now. I, it's interesting, the psychology. We can go with 30 minutes. It starts to even out, right? An hour. Still, see a, lot of, see a lot of shorts. I will go 12 hours. Evens out. Then 24 hours, it should be pretty baseline. Still, you still have a little bit more shorts than you do, do have long. So the question is why? Why are people out there just like going, time to leverage? And I will remind you of this. Uh, not everybody's right. If you look at, this, at these charts right here, and there's different, different strategies you can do, I'm sure. But 50% of these people, roughly, or 48%, 52%, are going to be wrong. And we're going to see those massive liquidations come about, which we've seen just a week ago, and just two months ago, and just before that, three months ago. And what leads to is extreme volatility and massive shakeout. People get scared because, like, what happened to the price? It's going down. No one believes in it. And that's just how it goes. And they start to sell off. And that's the problem with, with leverage. A lot of people make, or some people make a lot of money. Spooks the market, they get out. But why? And the reason is this. If you take a look at Into the Block, it's a great website, app.intheblock.com. And there's this thing called, let me blow this up, historical in, out of the money. What this means is, essentially, how many people are in the money based on the price, the current price of Bitcoin? We know that everything falls Bitcoin, right? So if we take a look here, when the Bitcoin price was at its some of its all times high, all time high, twenty six seven seventy three twenty five. Remember those days? Oh, those are great days. December twenty six twenty twenty, right before, right for the New Year's. Ah, oh, everybody's having a great time. You, you see it like a hundred percent. I'm pointing the screen like you can see it. A hundred percent of people were in the money. Nobody was out because we hit all time highs, and then we kept doing that, and everybody was exuberant. And then, of course, just like we saw over there, we started to short and people sold. And that's just how it is. And then it comes down. And what I was thinking was, you know, we're at a price of, what are, where are we at? 40,000? So I was like, there should be some, a lot of people, because I get a lot of people complaining in the, in the comments, like, I bought at the top and, and there was a the wrong mistake and now I got to sell a kidney or whatever. And, you know, that's awful. I don't want to sell kidneys or kids or whatever. But in all honesty, if you take a look at the data, Who's in the money? Uh, in November 21st, it was almost 90%. Then, of course, it goes down as the price goes down. It makes sense, right? And that, that pinkish area is the red. That's who's out of the money. And even over here, on Sunday, April 3rd, we had almost, a, we had almost three fourths of people who were in the money 71, almost 72%. Out of the money, it was 22%. Now, today, as it drips, dips down to 40,289, you still got 60% of people are still in the money. And 4% are like right around that range of their okay. It's almost 60, that's yeah, 65%. And 35% are out. So even though we hear these horror stories about people who are lo losing a lot of money in the market, it's still a huge amount of people who are in the money, which means it gives them that hubris, that pride, that, that ability to go, you know what? I'm, I'm, I can do this. I can, and some people can, I'm not going to take away from it. some people can, and they leverage like crazy. And once we get the shakeouts and once of course the liquidations happen, of course, it's the same thing over and over again. It never stops, which is I shouldn't have done the leverage trade. I shouldn't have done that. But you, but rarely do we hear people go, man, I made a boatload of money. Just, it just doesn't happen. But you do hear the people who are like, I shouldn't have done that. It's just one of those things and it spooks the market and off it goes. So I think there's some more volatility coming on. And that leads me to my next point, which we already talked about. Who's in the money? 
Now I want to talk to you about hodl waves and monthly averages because I think this will get to the meat of it. Now this was, we had done this yesterday on DCA show and uh, with me, James and Ben, I just want to go over it real quick because there was some year things I wanted to talk about. And real quick, before we go on, I'm, I will just say this. I believe, if we take a look at some, some data, that we're headed for a recession. I don't see, and of course, if we take a look at recessions, you know, what is a recession? Of course, it's economic downturn. But really what it is, is it's, uh, it's uh, two, consecu two consecutive quarters of a reduction in GDP. So we can see here from the FRED data that that's happened in 1970. We had a reduction in uh, this quarter, this quarter, this quarter. Recession, 1974, 79, 81, 89, 2001.com, 2008, I think we all remember that. Housing crash and everything else. And then 2020, of course, that thing called coronavirus, which was, of course, rebounded quite quickly. I personally don't see how we're going to increase uh, goods and services output uh, with the problems that we have with the Fed, with the inflation, with the uh, uh, bottlenecks in the supply chain, with China uh, locking down again, because that's where everybody kind of gets things. So I just don't see how we don't do it. And then also, James made a good point yesterday. He said, hey, uh, when you're in a recession, uh, these markers right here, these are, these are lagging indicators. We're already, he said, you're, when you're, you're already in a, in a recession before you, you see these, these indicators. And I personally think if, if we're not there, we're pretty darn close. And what that means, it's going to spook the market. It's going to start on S&P 500, NASDAQ. Those are going to sell off. It's going to hit us in the crypto market. And there it goes. Probably happen in a year or so. Not for sure. So that's my thesis. But I just want to remind people of a couple of things. And then I'll get to the plan a bit. So this part here, this is Ben's website, app.intothecryptoverse. And it helps to calm your nerves. I would recommend you sign up. It's like a hundred bucks. I think it, there's a sale going on. I don't know. I, I don't have a affiliate link. It's just a link to the website. So I, I, I love using it. So that's why I always talk about it. So anyhow, what we're talking about is like the monthly returns table. And obviously past performance cannot indicate present or what's going to happen in the present. I always, I always screw up that saying, but uh, you know what I mean? So you can start here on the average calculation start for 2010 if you wanted to. But again, if you do that, you're negating these, these months because they didn't exist at that point when they were check, cracking data or checking data, apparently. But you can see right here the averages down here, 7.2, 17.9. And it all breaks it down by month. And I just want you to focus on this as I, as I move forward. April is a pretty good month. And we're kind of sideways in April. I mean, we did a little bit of gains, but uh, we, we took some hits. And uh, 47, but look at this. In 2011, it was 418%. That's, that's an outlier. You know, here, this is more realistic. And then what I want you to notice is how it drops off a little bit in May. Not too bad. A little drop off in June. More drop off in July. A little drop off in August. September is kind of like a crappy month. Then October it kind of turns around November, December. I just want you to focus on that when we go through this. Here's 2010. Ah, 2011. See how the numbers change just a little bit? Let me go back, actually. 47.9. Oh, I hope it works this. Let's go to 2012. Ah, there we go. So if we, if we start in 2012, see how the numbers shift a little bit? So instead of April was 47.9, now we get, get rid of a couple of years, or 2010, 2011. But still, April, all right, 14.3. May, actually a little better. June drops off. July, a little bump, drop off in August. Big drop off in September. Looks pretty good, October, November, December. Just remember. How about 2013? Same thing. So again, how's this look? April, pretty good. May, not too bad. Drop off in June, a little rally. August, more drop off. September's a crappy month. October, November, December looking pretty good. 2014, ba ba 12.2, May's looking really good actually. 18, June, July, ah, eh, not too bad. A little drop off, big drop off. October, November, December looking good. 2015, I think you get the idea here. I'll, I'll just do this one more time. And it's going to lead me to my next point in a second. So April 14, May looking pretty good. 
little drop off June, little rally in July, August looking bad, December looking bad, October looking pretty good, November, December. So that is that part. I, I think I'm gonna have to jump around for a second. And I'm just gonna show you this. I made this new, this new playlist and it's, my, it's planning the crypto future. And I put in some, some videos I think that might be helpful because I can't talk about everything that I did in the last seven videos and condense it. But I will just say this, this video right here, sell Bitcoin in May and go away. And it's, if you've watched it, you know what I'm talking about, but it, it takes a look at data from the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, and how people have done as far as doing that strategy, which is an old strategy on Wall Street, also not just in the United States, but also across the globe. And statistically, it's turned out to be pretty, not 100% correct, because nothing's 100% correct. And again, past performance doesn't equal present. But it is interesting, and it makes a, a pretty good play of, hey, may not, may not be a bad time to take some profits. Also, I get into more of the, I need to spell better. M major is not major. Major bank predicts recession, and we talked about the recession, the recession numbers, the flipping of two and 10 yield bonds, why that is, and I, I put in DCA. Also talked about turning 2005 billion. This is for crypto IRAs, Puerto Rico, crypto exit strategies, uh, alternative to cash out, which is real estate, Airbnb and Verbo, and why I'm investing in, in uh, new stuff. So that's one of my plans. But the thing I was talking about here is I do think this is what I'm, I'll be doing is uh, I'll be taking a little bit of profits around May. But even though I'm doing that and people are like, oh, Rob's so negative uh, about crypto. I'm not negative about crypto. I've just been in this, this, this game for a while. I've been in since 2017. Some of you have been in longer than I have. So I think you can agree with some of these things. But there's one more thing I need to talk to you about. This is again from Ben. We talked about this last night. These, these hodl waves. And all this is, to put this quite simply, is take a look at the uh, long-term holders and what they what in this graph they decipher as long-term holders is when they hold more than 180 days. Select the, the uh, long-term holder button, clearly shows how these waves rise sharply during bear markets and capitulate during bull runs. Because this is what I consider smart money. So right now, this looks quite confusing, right? Let me just show you something. Long-term holders, when you click on that, you can see that as the price starts to peak, these long-term holders, people who hold more than 180 days, they tend to drop off quite quickly because what are they doing? They're like, this is overheated market. We need to get out. Here's in 2013, right? So before it actually peaked, a lot of these long-term holders said, forget, I'm out of here because I know what the next step is. So all that talk about diamond hands, you can diamond hands yourself, that's fine, but you gotta wait a long time. And it's whatever you wanna do. I can't tell you what to do. Sometimes it's just easier just to say, I'm just going to be right here and hold. And I'm going to buy every dip. You can do that. But I will tell you that sometimes take profits, and this is not financial advice. This is what I've done in the past. I should have done, but didn't. Uh, it works out pretty well. So again, long-term holders come here. And then when, it's, when the price starts to drop off, look what happens. Now oh, they start to buy back again. And then they buy back. And they're like, whoa, this is way overheated. Here's April 2017. They started to sell. Man, they started to sell off in May 2017. And then, of course, right when we get to the peak, that's when most of these long-term holders are gone. Same thing happened over here. When we start to peak at the price of 57, 69, 63, whatever it was, they just drop off the face of the planet. And the same thing's happening over here. And now what we're seeing, a little bit of drop-off. So maybe, maybe we'll see. And then if we take a look at the short-term holders, we can see the exact opposite happens. And this is the problem because the mentality is price goes up, I buy up. And then the problem is that people get stuck. And that's why we take a look at those in and out of the money. I think hopefully people are learning a little bit better. But uh, yeah, as the price peaks, you see these, these short-term holders, less than 180 days. They're accumulating like crazy, right? And then it goes down because they sell off. They sell off down here, not up here. Happens. Same thing over here. 
They start buying like crazy. Then they sort of sell off as it goes down, but not too bad. Same thing happens over here. And they start to sell off a little bit. So again, long-term looks pretty bright. Short-term, I'm not for sure what is going to happen. It's just, just something to consider. Again, I can't tell you what to do. And God knows I don't have a crystal ball, but that's just uh, the data that we see. So again, take a look at uh, a little bit of the past to see where you want to go. And then um, I put, so that'd be my last point, the plan again. Let me break this down. So the plan, I put it all right here. So around, and just like we talked about for those monthly averages, where I see things, again, I don't see, I mean, if this is, I mean, if regulation comes in and it's positive, great. If the war in Ukraine drops off, great. If these supply chains uh, don't are improve greatly and China releases everybody and says, okay, let's get back to work because of this coronavirus issue. Great, then I'll I might change my position, but right now as it stands, and I have a lot of faith moving forward in the overall economy. I have faith in crypto long-term, but the economy, which of course we see with the NASDAQ as it drops down, also pulls us down. So my plan is this, around May, like we talked about, I'll probably take in some more profits. And what I wanna do with those profits is, is do some more uh, real estate. So people had said to me, and I, I talked this a couple of days ago, doing the same thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some profits in around May or June, depending uh, what happens. They're like, well, why would you do that? Because you talked about how the market is ridiculous and crazy. And they're right. I wouldn't buy a house right now. That's not smart. But the thing is, you have to plan now for six to 12 months in the future, 18 months, 24 months. You can't just be like, oh, now it's crashing and it's crashed, now I'm gonna sell. That's not a good plan. The plan is to kind of get ahead of it as best as best you can. And again, you could be, I could be wrong. And if I take these, if I take this profits along the way and uh, it just shoots up, well, then I, I take a little bit of a haircut, you know, five, 10% or more, hopefully not, hopefully I catch it and get back in. But if I'm right, what we, what we plan to do is take some profits here, put some things aside. We already have a house uh, here, another house in El Paso. Whoa that uh, we're renting out to a person in the military who is, he's getting uh, sent, sent back. He's from the, he's the German Air Force guy, nice guy. So we're gonna turn that into, uh, instead of a long-term rental, a short-term rental. So we need to do a lot of renovation. So we'll probably take some profits, put that in the renovation, put that into Airbnb, Verbo, and go from there. Works out pretty well. You'd be surprised, people do do a lot of uh, traveling and they come right through El Paso. You know why they call it El Paso? It's the pass. It's just a stopover city sometimes uh, between like uh, the Western United States and then Central Texas. So a lot of people need these places. So that's what we're gonna do. And if you wanna take a look at that playlist, it's all right here. Then also I have to ask you guys something for a little input. A lot of people ask me about the real estate thing that me and my wife do. Would you like to see me do more of that stuff on a separate channel about how we renovate, how we pick the houses, how the cash flow works, how we set up Airbnb and Verbo for, for passive income? Or is this like not what you want to do? If not, just let me know in the comments. I just won't do it. It's just more, more work for me to do. So that's great. But I did do a, a decent job here in uh, explaining all those things that we use, like the different tools like AirDNA and stuff like that. So check it out. So that is my, my plan. And I also put in this one, uh, why I'm investing in this celebrity fighting crypto token. And again, this is uh, this is a degenerate play. <laughs> this is on my second channel that I put on here. And I think that 5% of uh, betting on some, some long shots, that's what I'll be doing, not what you should do. But I think this one's big and uh, I talk about why uh, in there. And that's it. So lastly, just to bring it home, uh, I trust capital. Just so you know, it's the 16th today, right? You got two more days to where if you wanna, just like what Peter Thiel did, you know, he put a bunch of his PayPal stock into a, a Roth IRA when it wasn't worth squat, less than 7,000, less than 6,000 bucks back in the 90s. Then it grew up to, grew to 5 billion and he's gonna pay 0% capital gains tax on that. So that's the whole theory behind a Roth IRA with crypto, same thing. So there's a link in the description, 
and uh, I did a, a explainer video, very simple to use. Also, there's no more monthly fees. There's a 1% transaction fees. If you want to trade within your account, if you think that things are going to go down, you can sell it for, you can sell your, your Bitcoin or Ethereum or Avalanche, whatever is in there. And you can uh, put it into cash, hold it into cash and then put another crypto later on if you wanted to. And then, uh, yeah, no fees. So it works out pretty well. Also, Masterworks, this is another one of my plans. It's about buying fractionalized shares of fine art. And these are all registered securities with the SEC. That's one of the paintings I actually have. And then lastly, you got two days. If you're in America, you got two days to file your taxes. Here's Crypto Trader. You take 20% off with the link. I've been using this for a while, two years now. Saved my A uh, many a times. And that's what's going on. So look, I know that's a little bit longer. Sorry. Didn't want to do that. Let's go over uh, your questions because I'm sure you got some. And then we'll get out of here and enjoy this weekend, huh? All right. So here we go. <laughs> I'm going all in on tomato coin. Not a bad plan. Yeah, so Marky, just so everybody knows, like if I do real estate, it won't be this channel. No one wants to see real estate on a crypto channel. It'll be a separate channel. Yeah. I'll call it uh, Real Estate Asset News. Rianne. No, that's, that's not a good one. Des said, yeah, sure. Uh, oh, great. To your designer. I need one of those. You got to get to the boss, though. My wife. Yeah, I don't like to put those publicly. I'd like to... and." And rent your places. I mean, I, I could, but no. Seven so channels, good. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, I do that. Okay. Damn it. I was kind of hoping everybody would say no, so I wouldn't have to do it. But hey, got to give people what they want. So this is a good question. Question number one. Did you say no capital gains if you use a light network to buy stuff? So this is straight from the Miami conference when Jack Mallers came up and he talked about it and he gave, it's like a 44 minute video. Just type in Jack Mallers Bitcoin conference and you'll, it'll come up And in that 44 minutes. And we played a part of it and he said, there's no capital gains because what happens is when you buy something, let's say me and you, me and you law Hoff 95, we buy something. So there's, there's five people between us. Well, there's me and you, right? And then we've got, uh, our bank, your bank, and then the rail, the payment rail, whatever that is, Visa, MasterCard, whatever else. That's just a payment rail, right? So they take a cut, the banks take a cut, and everybody's happy so far. So with this one, what Lightning Network is doing is they're just the payment rail. They're not using, I mean, using the Lightning Network to, to move funds across. But if I pay and like you say, give me some euros. Sure, I guess. So I send you, well, I can, I can pay you in dollars. Goes in the Lightning Network goes across for next to nothing, and then it arrives to you in euros. And there's no capital gains because it's instantly transferred over. And you're not using Bitcoin from the one that you bought. That is what was explained to me by Jack Mahler. So I, I want you to take a look at that. Now that is just on the merchant side of how those things work. For a Lightning Network, I think it's a little bit different, but I could be wrong. Question number two, are you learning Spanish, Dan? Yes, I am. I have a tutor from Preply, and I see this guy, Elias, twice a week and my spanish is still awful so but you got to learn it man and if you want to and that was you know at least my next i should have talked about this in that um let me show you something in that playlist uh right down here for the puerto rico thing like you know that's that, that didn't help me a ton this this year because of, you know, there's, there's no capital gains tax in Puerto Rico. But I will tell you, this is going to set me and my family up for a, for a while moving down the road. So in the next major bull run, that could be this year, it could be 2023, 24. I have no idea. I don't know. I don't really, I, I, I try not to dwell on it too much. I know it's going to happen just in the when. So that's going to set me up big time. And that's the big plan. And that's why you got to plan yourself out six months 12 months, 18 months, 36 months to really take advantage. And that's what we did. And uh, it's a slow game, but it's a game you can win. It just takes a lot of 
uh, thought and patience. That's what it comes down to. Uh, question number th four, maybe, is Voyager digital stock doomed? Well, the stock is the stock, is the stock. The token is the token. So the stock itself, I think, is, is still pretty strong. And um, remember, this is probably a question that you have based on what happened with Celsius. We did a video about that, actually, just three days, four days ago. And you can watch what's going on. But in a nutshell, regulators came down in Celsius. Celsius bowed the knee. I can't blame them because do you want to tussle with the SEC? I mean, Mark Cuban did. He did win that battle. But uh, do you want to do that and potentially lose out on hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees and, and penalties? Probably not. And they want to work with them. So fine, whatever. But what it means is if you're outside of the United States, you don't have to worry about anything. Don't worry about it. If you're outside of the United States, it doesn't apply to you. But if you're in the United States and you are a non-accredited investor, meaning you make less than $200,000 per year or less than $5 million in your corporation, you're not an accredited investor, you're not accredited, and you will not gain yield on your crypto that you have on Celsius, anything that's deposited after April 15th. So like here, if you had crypto on Celsius for years up to April 14th, you will still gain yield on those Celsius, uh, on the Celsius platform for Bitcoin or whatever else that you have on there, right? After the 15th, whatever you put in there, you're not gonna gain yield. I think it's gonna hurt, the, hurt their business a little bit, but that's just America. So the question then is, well, if it happened to BlockFi, I think it happened to Nexo, and if it happened to Celsius, what's gonna happen with Voyager and their yield program? My next question is, what's gonna happen with Gemini and their yield program too? So that question is up to legal? I don't know. I've asked Steve to come on the show. I'm like, hey, will legal let you come on my show and talk about it? He's like, I'll keep you posted. Nothing yet. So, which means to me, they're still going through the process. And, um, and we'll see. But I will say that if you take a look at the filings for Voyager, because Voyager uses Celsius for yield products. So just so you know, it was like, it was between three and 6.4%. I forgot the exact numbers. It wasn't that much. And over 60% was in BVI, the British Virgin Islands. And that has no, no bearing on what the SEC or, or the reach that the SEC has. So um, they can't reach out to that, but the same thing could be said for Binance. Well, they have no uh, legal authority for Binance, but they can stop off Binance. And, and that's why Binance now is Binance US because America's a bunch of jerks. So yeah. So to answer your question, is it doomed? I don't think it's doomed. I think it's uh, we're in a pending status and we'll see how it all plays out. But I would not be buying a ton of <laughs> Voyager stock right now. Way too volatile. Here's a great question. Do you think everyone will have to be an accredited investor in crypto eventually? I think no, because he, he, okay, he, here's how here's how here's how it works. So like in the in the old heyday to get into getting just regular stocks back in the day before Robinhood. I know there was a day before that. You had to be pretty big baller. You had to be an accredited investor, right? And now it's like anybody can get into uh, Robinhood. You can just pull up the app and just start, you know, trading to your heart's content. And people lose their money, or they, you know, they try to do some plays. It doesn't work out. SEC is like, well, it is what it is, and uh, not a big deal. So I think what's probably going to happen: Gary Gensler, who watches the show, hello, Gary. You're doing a bad job, Gary. You're doing an awful job at this. You really need to step up and uh, you need to get rid of this, this accredited investor nonsense. It's okay for everybody to go to the casino and blow their life savings on 18 black, but don't do anything to gain you yield. Uh, put it in a bank where you get 0.0025%. That's safe. And in a thousand years, you'll really, really uh, gain. So I think what'll happen is this, growing pains, regulation, which I've talked about, I compare it to cake. Regulation is going to come. They're going to go too hard because they don't understand the ramifications. Once they figure out the ramifications, just like what's happening in India, where India is taxing all their citizens, which I'm sorry, guys, 30% plus a 1% basis fee or something like that for every different trade they do, even if they lose or if they gain, they can't even, they can't even gift it. And it's, it's putting a massive hindrance on the trading activity of crypto. And people are like, well, I can't make any money, so I'm out. 
and it's smart. I would do the same thing. So they're going to figure out, whoa, 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 wait, we need tax revenue because we kept printing like crazy. So we're not going to miss out on this. Besides, China just dropped the ball. They kicked out all the, all the miners. Kazakhstan just had a big uh, uproar with their uh, electricity. And then also they want to tax the living tar out of the miners. And different countries like that are also failing. We're doing pretty good in the U.S. and Canada. Parts, maybe parts of Mexico, I don't know. Uh, as we get Bitcoin miners, they're like, we don't need to lose this tax revenue. Let's open it up. They're going to start there. We're going to have some really good people like Tom Emmer and Lummis uh, from Wyoming, Senator. And they're going to say, you can't do that. This is where we need to be. And of course, we have an, uh, an, an action, a PAC coming in, an action committee for Bitcoin. And they're going to say, look, here's what you really want to do. If you want to lose your seats and have different problems, just keep screwing around with crypto because people want that. And they're going to be like, you know what? We'll probably go the other way. That's my theory. Could be wrong. <laughs> Robin Guy reference that. No, I, I just I watched his channel. Oh, speaking of which, I'll be in London on uh, May 5th, 6th, and 7th for Guy's thing his conference. That'll be fun. So the things that I talk about, I'm going to, the big thing I'm going to talk about over there is, uh, well, we're going to, we're going to talk crypto on stage and then we're also going to talk about some of the things that I've seen in, uh, uh, tax minimization and things like that. So check that out. Dougie. Oh, okay. India's on your DEXs. And then we got to go one more, one more question. Last question, run for president, no, 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 I don't think so. But you know who'd be a great, who'd be, who'd be a great candidate? Elon Musk and The Rock. I, I, I post that on Twitter, I go, man, who would beat those two? You know, crazy. And then if we, if we went the opposite ways, I thought if you're just gonna go politicians, what about uh, Mayor Suarez in Miami as the presidential candidate? Because he's already, you know, he's in a great state. Uh, people seem to love him. Uh, and then, of course, he could pick his running mate, which would be Tom Emmer uh, from, I want to say he's from Minnesota, and he's super pro-Bitcoin. I thought that would be like the power couple, and I would vote for that. So that's it. So look, guys, 37 minutes is a little long. Sorry about that, but I had to get some things done. But that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, like it subscribe. We do these things every single day, mostly news, not this stuff. And all the things we just talked about, links in the description, especially that playlist. So that's it. Thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.